As Guyana sits on the economic and political crossroads, we speak to the nation's opinion leaders and decision makers to get their views on the challenges the country faces and the path it must take to achieve national development. Welcome to Nation Watch. Now here is your host Mervyn Williams, former member of the Guyana Parliament. Hello and welcome to Nation Watch for today, Sunday, 25th February 2024. I'm Mervyn Williams, your host. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are. And I trust that, as usual, you will stay with us throughout the program. Recently, the People's National Congress reform uh, celebrated and commemorated the life of Lyndon Forbes Samson Burnham, our party's founder leader. More recently, um, Mr. Burnham, who was born on the 20th of February, 1923, and died on the 6th of August, 1985, um, was celebrated last evening in commemoration of his 101st birth anniversary the Burnham Foundation held a gala. And the only thing I will say to the organizers is that you need to find a venue that is at least twice as large as the one we had last evening. For viewers who are not um, perhaps familiar with the life of Mr. Burnham, Let me just bring you into the picture. Mr. Burnham was elected leader of the British Guyana Labour Party in 1949. And then in 1950, the British Guyana Labour Party joined with what was then the Political Affairs Committee led by Dr. Jagan. And the result was the for formation of the People's Progressive Party, which incidentally was named by Mr. Burnham, who served as its first chairman. Mr. Burnham served as premier of British Guyana from 1964 to 1966, after which he led Guyana to independence and served as our first prime minister of independent Guyana from 1964 to 1980. Mr. Burnham then came our first executive president in 1980 and served in that capacity until his death in 1985. So last evening, in commemoration of his 101st birth anniversary, the Burnham Foundation held this event. And I'm now joined by Mr. Vincent Alexander, who is um, the chairperson of that foundation and I'd like to welcome Mr. Alexander. And as always, sir, it's a pleasure to have you on Nation Watch. Thank you very much, Morgan. It's a pleasure to be here. We will run by you, viewers, um, a few still shots of last evening's or last night's event. And I'll ask Mr. Alexander to um, tell us a bit of what went into it and whether or not he is satisfied. I'm sure he is, Ms. Alexander. Thank you very much, Morgan. First of all, let me put in a disclaimer. I, I'm indeed the chairperson of the Burnham Foundation, but the activity last night was not an activity of the Burnham Foundation. 
it is not, it was an activity of the People's National Congress Reform. Uh, that party established a committee to commemorate the centennial birth anniversary of Burnham. And I was given the honor as chair of the Burnham Foundation to chair the centennial committee. And therefore, it is the centennial committee, in fact, uh, that uh, organized the event last year. It was organized as the final event in a year of activity starting in February last year to commemorate the centennial birth anniversary of Lyndon Fox Samson Burnham. And indeed, it ushered in his 101st birthday as, as well, or she didn't hurt her the first birthday. So that, that's the kind of uh, background to what we were doing last night. And in fact, from February of last year, we had a number of activities starting with the massive church service at Trinity Methodist. And we chose Trinity Methodist, not to be what we expected, and we had. Because really annually, Burnham's birth anniversary celebrated with Kitty Methodist, the church which he attended, mm -hmm. the church which his father was a lay reader at, and um, the Kitty Methodist, in fact, school has been named the J.E. Burnham School yeah. in memory of his father. And then we had a number of other activities, including the NCW having a massive rally at their headquarters on Public Road Kitty. We had the usual cycle race. We had a symposium. So there were a number of activities leading up to this uh, gal we had last night. And indeed, uh, you, 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 you're correct. We were um, not able to provide all those who wanted to attend an opportunity to attend because the hall space was limited. And the people were asking for tickets when we were already sold out so that indeed we have to look in the future to a different venue uh, for this activity because clearly um, the venue is a good venue in terms of the ambience, in terms of the service provided, but certainly a small venue in terms of the number of people who wanted to attend that activity. Absolutely. Hats off to the people who made, made the event possible. I, I was very impressed. I must tell you. Well, I should take the opportunity to express my appreciation to the members of the committee, those members who actively worked uh, to make it possible, and to all of those persons uh, who attended, and to uh, apologize <laughs> to all of those uh, who could not, who could not attend because of the number of people we were had to cater for given the size of the venue. Mr. Alexander, I want to shift into another realm of the celebration of the life and works of Lyndon Ford Sampson Burnham, bringing the conversation to the current situation in Guyana. Mr. Burnham was himself a trade unionist. Mr. Burnham was elected um, president, I believe it, the title was, of the British Guyana Labor Union in 1952. I believe he served in that capacity until the very end, until his death in 1985. A long journey of an advocate for the working class population of a country that transitioned from colonial um, rule to independence and then later on to Republican status under his stewardship. We come from a long line of um, labor leaders, Hubert Nathaniel Critchlow, Joseph Polydor, Ashton Chase, Jedi Jagon, Forbes Burnham, whose foremost responsibility it seemed that they assumed was to make life better for the workers of this country, to create a better atmosphere, a better environment, better wages, better conditions of work. And of those leaders, Chedi Jagan and Forbes Warren became um, executive leaders, executive presidents of this country. What we have now 
is a teacher's strike that is entering its fourth week. What we have now are successors of Dr. Jagan in the People's Progressive Party who seem to have turned their backs on the legacy and hard work of Jagan and Burnham in industrial relations and workers' rights. How would Burnham have treated with a situation like the one we faced with? Marvin, uh, allow me to cast this a little wider. Because there are those who are now claiming that the activity of a trade union are politicized and their political activities and are trying to portray that there has to be a distancing, trying to portray, Marky, there has to be a distancing between political activities and political parties. But one of the cast is why there. If one looks at the West Indies, one would see that in the West Indies, that in fact, the leaders of the independence movement, almost all of them emerge from, from the, the trade union. Right. Whether we talk about Manny and Bustamante in Jamaica, whether we talk about Eric Williams and Pandey in Trinidad and Tobago, whether we talk about Bird in Antigua, as you go across the entire region, yes. there is clearly a relationship between political activism and trade unionism. And in fact, in most instances, as I've indicated already, the leaders of the nations were birthed in the trade union movement. So this is the first point I want to make, that we have to recognize our history and the fact that uh, nation building and those persons who emerged as leaders came through the trade union movement. And many of them retained uh, their relationship with the trade union movement onto their death. And uh, Burnham and Jacob are two <laughs> giants yeah. in, in that regard. So that's that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that, you know, we are really seeing a betrayal of Jagan in the manner of behavior of the People's Progressive Party. A betrayal in more than one sense. In more than one sense. For example, the People's Progressive Party has contended it's a Marxist Lenin's party. And notwithstanding where it has gone in terms of its economic programs, at every Congress of the party, it has maintained that it has not changed its political uh, ideology. Though we have seen some statements come out of Barry Jack who would suggest that it has changed, but the party formally has not changed its political ideology. And its political ideology is grounded, I would say, Marxism Leninism. And if one reviews where Marxism Leninism stands on the question, again one sees one of the seminal works of Lenin, Stodelat, what's to be done. That seminal work makes it clear that the political movement has got to find a way to work with the working people and the trade union movement, because that is where the working people are really located. They're located there in much larger numbers than they're located in any political party. But at any political party, which really wants to represent their interests, has to associate itself with their body and that's the trade union movement. So that all of this talk that we're hearing about politics and, and, and the GTUC and all of that and the GTU really represents a betrayal of where the PPP historically stood on the question of trade unionism. That is what it represents. So we need, we, we, we need to understand that. So that they, they could, they should never be a question of the relationship between a trade union body 
and a political party in the context of a party that is seeking to represent the interests of the working people. But having said that, let me fast forward immediately because that, that represents a betrayal of, of Dave and, and the PDP. But let me fast forward to say that even in the face of that contention, that theoretical and philosophical contention, when one looks at the current situation, the issue that is before us is not an issue of a relationship between any party and the Ghana Teachers Union. That is not the issue. The issue is one of how do we treat with trade union rights and collective bargaining. That's the issue. And therefore, let me go back again. The PPP could be credited under the leadership of Jacob for being, among others, who struggled for the recognition of trade unions. Yes. And we know what happened in the 60s in terms of the trade union recognition bill. We know what happened when Jacob came to power in terms of the trade union recognition. And so here we see again a betrayal of Jagan because he can be seen as foremost in the struggle for trade union recognition. And here is his party being seen foremost in trying to de-recognize. More like demolish. And demolish trade unions. So clearly the PPP has lost its way in terms of its founder and the ideology and philosophy it is supposed to have embraced and has become an oppressive body that seeks to oppress the working people and to demolish and de-recognize the organ of the working people in their struggle. And so let me get back to the question of the collective, uh, collective bargaining. This situation today is not about the association which have established is legitimate between a trade union and a political party. It's about not recognizing because they want to dominate all of the space, all of the political space, a trade union. The GTU, G, the Ghana Teachers Union, I think it's two years ago, they have biennial elections. Mm -hmm. It's a duly registered body of the teachers, and the leadership is duly elected by those teachers. In an election where we have heard absolutely no questions being raised about his conduct, so that those who are in leadership have been duly elected. They are the union which, under the laws of Ghana, are authorized to represent the teachers. They are representing the teachers in the context of collective bargaining. Now, there are two things that jump out at us. Everybody in the government and some others are talking about, well, why don't they wait? Um, how much they've gotten in the past, and that kind of thing. That is not the issue. The issue is that they have a right under the laws of Ghana and the traditions of the trade union movement to be engaged in collective bargaining. And what this government has done is deny, it's seeking to deny them that right. And in seeking to deny them that right, they are trying to fool the people of Ghana about the reality. It is true that there are some talks that have taken place, though those talks have not been conducted properly, between the teachers' union and the government in the person of the Ministry of Education. But it is also true that the Ministry of Education has made it clear to the teachers' union that they do not bargain in relation to salaries. They do not bargain in relation to salaries. And that bargaining in relation to salaries is conducted by the office of the president and, in fact, the president himself. 
And the fact of the matter is that the president has not afforded the teachers union an opportunity to engage in a process which he has determined he should be involved in. And what he has done instead is to select some hand-picked people, take them to the, the state house, have a conversation with them, and deny the Ghana Teachers Union the opportunity to do what they are legally entitled to do. And therefore, for all intents and purposes, that process of collective bargaining and negotiation has not taken place, has broken down in relation to salaries. And therefore, there's legal basis for the teachers union to, in the first instance, call for reconciliation. And hence, they call on the Ministry of Labor to engage in that process. And we have that toothless bulldog in the person of the Minister of Labor saying that there are negotiations and it hasn't broken down. I mean, it's bastard for him to speak to this nation and to say that negotiations have not broken down when his president is the one and his minister of labor is the one who have said that negotiations on the matter of salaries ought to be conducted with the president and the president has not entertained any such conduct of negotiations and therefore has caused negotiations to, be, to, to, broke, to break down. And hence, they correctly ask for reconciliation. He has denied them that legal right to reconciliation. And therefore, they have embarked upon a strike as is tradition when negotiations have broken down and the process has not uh, eventuated as it should. Well, it appears as though there's a vacancy um, for Minister of Labor as, as, as we speak because. <laughs> Nothing flows from there, but I want to go back to where I started. And this is to reinforce the wider point that you made. Mr. Burnham's union, the British Guyana, um, Mr. Burnham's party, the British Guyana Labour Party, came out of that union. Um, Mr. Jagan came out of the Political Affairs Committee. These two national giants, advocated in the case of Mr. Um, Mr. Jagan for the dock workers and later sugar workers. Um, Mr. Burnham, generally the public service area. And their cause is recorded. Their works are recorded. Now, what we have is a situation where not only is there a betrayal, but there is a, a glaring manifestation of double standards. Dr. Jagan fought for these, these values and these rights for workers. The PPP seemed to have embarked on a tradition. You remember the 1999 strike, which lasted for 57 days. And Mr. Jack Dio, who was then, I believe, a junior minister of finance, said to the world that public servants were not going to get one black cent more. Those were his words, as I recall them. And now, fast forward to 2024, we have a situation where the People's Progressive Party is threatening the workers, the teachers in this instance, that we're going to cut your pay. We're not going to pay you for the time that you don't work. Well, the court has said that until the hearing and determination of the matter, nobody's pay will be cut. Um, we hear threats of termination of employment, termination of contracts of employment. We hear of the possibilities of criminal charges being instituted against persons who engage in quote unquote unlawful strike action. So, in the same way as the PPP of 1999 treated the public service strike, in very much the same way in 2024, the PPP of 2024 is treating the Ghana Teachers Union strike. Now, the Ghana Public Service Union has said, look, government, if you don't come to the table, you don't talk um, about 
um, collective bargaining as you have outlined. Then the GPSU will bring out its members in solidarity with the teachers. Commentators have had lots to say about this, that if the public service union comes out, it means that it's a political attack against the government, um, seeking to put the government in the back foot. There appears to be no clear understanding on the government of how to treat with industrial relations matters and particularly the industrial relations climate of today. Hence my earlier suggestion that there may very well be a vacancy in the office of Minister of Labor. Um, how do we get across this hurdle in the best interest of the people, the working people of this country? First of all, say that there is a clear oxymoron historically, uh, notwithstanding what I said earlier on about because we do have that historical moment, where the union also said not to say more. But we do have that historical moment mm -hmm. where he also said uh, not a more. The public service uh, in the late nineties were also engaged in a struggle conditions and salaries. And we saw the, they got to the point where arbitration was appointed. So we saw due process in some regards uh, manifested itself in the, in the late 90s. And we had the arbitration, and the arbitration eventually awarded the public servants, I think it was 30 to 33, a 30 percent increase. But the significant parallels to be done. There. At that time, the government tell you they did not have the resources to pay the money. We saw there was an award and they were able to pay. And therefore, it shows that they were not truthful in their contention that they did not have the resources because they were able to find, to pay, and there were no debting effects on the economy of the by virtue of the payment. Today, the PPP claims what, that what happened in that 99 period is their generosity. Generosity. <laughs> they they bold face. There's nothing about their generosity. <laughs> they, they, they oppose it. It's only because the arbitration imposed that they paid. That that so they cannot claim that they treated an interest or concern for the working people by that increase. That came through the struggle of the working people in 1999. So today again we see a claim being made that they don't have the resources uh, at this time to make the payment. But I made the point that the issue really doesn't start with the question of the resources. The issue starts with the right to bargaining. Whether they have the resources or not is a matter that can be determined in the course of time, either through negotiation with them, through conciliation, and through arbitration. And it is these processes that they are fighting against and seeking to impose their will as they sought to do, but unsuccessfully, in 1999. And so, again, I want to refocus on this question of what is it that's at the center of the issue today? Because a lot of people are off focus and looking straight at the question of affordability, rather the question of due process, which is enshrined in our constitution and our labor laws. And I want to make the point in that regard that when we come to speak about Lyndon Fab Samson Burnham, we need to remember that 
recognition of the Guyana Agricultural Workers Union came about under Burns regime. So here we can see clearly a disposition of Burnham to this matter that led to the recognition of a union that was associated with the political party, that was involved in a whole range of spontaneous uh, illegal strikes. The, the GAW has a history up to today of calling strikes going through the process of reconciliation and all of that. They can get one next morning because of the strike and the union endorses it. It is what their history speaks to. The union gained recognition on the regime of Lyndon Stamps. And we do recall Barnum's disposition to trade unionism. Because Winston, Winston, um, Minister of Labor, Carrington, he was a trade union leader as well. I think he was a trade union leader for the transport world. But he was also a member of the People's National Congress and also became the Minister of Labor. And I remember vividly Winston, Winslow Carrington, PNC, a general counsel, in the presence of Burnham State, that his first loyalty was to the workers, and that was necessary if he had to confront his party on behalf of the workers, he would do so. And so there was a clear acceptance by the PNC and by Burnham of where the trade union movement was located in terms of the representation of the interests of the working people. And so Carrington was accommodated, was, was accepted, was recognized as a trade unionist and allowed to play his role in the trade union movement, even when it meant that he had to clash with the party to which he belonged. And Burnham took absolutely not, not no action against him. So we see here a Burnham who, in the face of the conduct of business by the Guyana Agricultural Workers Union, still went ahead and ensured their recognition. I think uh, Harry Lal was, the, was the, 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 chief, the chief person of that union at that time, who eventually joined the People's National Congress. And we see his conduct in relation to Winslow Carrington, who clearly said to Burnham, openly in the general council, my first loyalty is to the workers. And it doesn't matter what this party has to say. Once I think the workers are in the right, I will be on, the, on their side, even as I continue to be a member of this party. And challenge Burnham, and Burnham did absolutely nothing to interfere with him in the status of a trade union leader and his status as a member of the People's National Congress at a senior level. And in fact, he became the Minister of, of Labor. Interesting, I believe. Um, something can be learned from that in the vacant office of Minister of Labor. Much to be learned. Arbitration in 1999 led to the award you spoke of. There were some other issues or some other tag-ons to the, to the remuneration um, aspect of the award that were not honored by the People's Progressive Party. What, in fact, the People's Progressive Party did instead was to take to the National Assembly um, the essential services the amendment that brought in essential services and locked them out from um, striking, in a sense. What the People's Progressive Party did in retaliation against the workers of this country following the successful 1999-57 day strike was to 
put in the laws of Guyana prohibitions, measures that prevented the exercise of the right to strike. Share with us, Mr. Alexander, your thoughts on this union busting approach using the laws of Guyana as the basis for um, for hurting the labor movement. And if you have a moment to speak to the, the disregard for the aspects of the award of 1999, I believe it was the Armstrong Award. First of all, let me say that in the face of the current action by the Ghana Teachers Union, we have heard some mountains for representatives, representatives of the people who are suggesting that that bill, which dealt with utilities, yes. should be extended to include the teachers because they are quote unquote also in essential service. So that we see this regressive move by the You see, it is not something that really was intended to deal with the delivery of services uninhibited to our people. It was intended to give them control and a mechanism not to engage the representatives of the working people on certain matters. But I want to go a little further on this. There's a dynamic here that we need to understand that has some ideological underpinnings and some attitudinal underpinnings. We have today been talking all along about the working people. And, and, and you know, there's the assumption when we talk about the working people that once somebody works, they're a member of the working people. But there's a PBB interpretation that does not correspond with that. And it partly comes out of their Leninist orientation. Let's say that we're talking about the working people as akin to the working class. And definitionally, definitionally, in the Leninist uh, lexicon, the working class does not include people in the service sector. Only speaks to people in the productive, the direct productive sector. So that subliminally, when the PVP talks about the working class, they're not really talking about the people in the service sector. Well, legally, well, in terms of legislation, I have come to the understanding that the term worker in the industrial relations context in Guyana excludes the Guyana police force, the Guyana fire service, and the Guyana prison that, service. That, that is true, but I, I, I'm not dealing here with the legal. I'm dealing with the I hear you. Their disposition, which is manifest in their actions. And their disposition is not the service sector as the working class. And therefore, the attitude towards the service sector is manifestly different to the attitude towards, quote unquote, the working class they talk about. And so, for example, you can see, for example, in the issue of Gaisuko, the PPP says, you know, we owe these people. They're the working class. They're the working class. We owe them. And therefore, though the industry is not making a profit, we have a debt to them. And we have to continue to pay them that debt. Now, I'm not going to get involved in the, the issue of the contribution that the sugar workers have made to this economy. But I'm just making the point that there's, there's differential treatment by the PPP to the people who they describe as the working class as opposed to those who are not described as a working class. But I want to go further. I want to go further in this dynamic situation. Because in that process, 
there is also an ethnic element. And this is a part of Diana's problem. Even in the definition and the attitude, when it comes to the working class of the bauxite industry and their real workers, their treatment is different to the working class in the agricultural sector. And so we see there's also an ethnic bias in their actions and their quote unquote uh, application of their own ideology. And so they treat the bauxite industry different to the manner in which they treat the sugar industry. And this treatment is manifest in a various ways. And let me give an example uh, of an issue when I myself confronted Chen uh, The definition of the working class, as I said earlier on, is about direct productive workers. But the definition goes on to say that those persons, all that they have at their disposal is their labor. And therefore, they don't have a resort to anything else if they're not working and paid. Now, taking that definition, I raise the question on one occasion to Chendi Jaeger. Why is it that his party, that claims to be a Marxist party, claims to represent the working class, could not find it possible in the electoral process to put up candidates and represent the people of Linden? And this is a historical fact that in our electoral processes, there are instances where the People's Progressive Party did not contest in Linden. I think it was more for the region than for the national, but did not contest in Linden. And therefore, they walked away from these people who were supposed to be, by their definition, the working class. And so I'm saying this again demonstrates the ethnic issue which finds itself into the body politics of our nation. I want to piggyback on that. Um, the People's Progressive Party has created advertisements, nice videos and so on. And I know that you've dealt with the issue of unionism, workers, and political parties already. But in the context of the propaganda of the People's Progressive Party, you, you may wish to revisit it just for a brief moment. They have described the Ghana Teachers Union strike as racist and political. And when Mr. Jagdeo speaks about the People's National Congress, his favorite word seems to be racist. And when he speaks about persons standing up for their rights against a vindictive Jagali, as I call it, administration. His favorite word is racist when it comes to describing people who advocate for the rights and the rights of others. Comment, I'm sorry I had to break you there, but comment, if you will, please, on this whole question of the defining of the GTU strike as racist and political against the background of what you just said. Well, first of all, let's, let's accept to a very large extent, that the teaching profession is populated by people of African descent. To a very large extent, it's populated, and I may go on to say dominated, by people of African descent. Secondly, the People's National Congress has historically uh, been supported by people of African descent. And this has to do with what we seem not to want to recognize and something that, in fact, the Bernard Foundation sought to speak to in our most recent symposium, where we said we should return to ground zero in terms of the politics of this country. Whether the People's Progressive Party was formed, 
there was a conscious understanding at that time that we needed to unite the races and more specifically the people of African descent and the people of Indian descent. And it's that consciousness that led to a conscious effort to ensure that in the leadership of the party, you had the leadership of the Indian community, so to speak, and leadership from the Afri African community. So Guyana started off with a recognition that we were a plural society and that historically uh, the British did things to divide us in their interests and that we should come together to work unitedly if we were to confront the British and to gain independence and beyond that, if we to build that. So that's, that's the platform. So that what Jagdeo is seeking to do is to de-recognize the historical facts of our country and to de-recognize the fact that his party has historically attracted Hindu Guyanese in a manner in which the People's National Congress has historically attracted people of African descent. And that this has nothing to do with racism. It has to do with the fact that even in the population of Guyana, we came at different times, separate groups, culturally different in many regards, and therefore naturally inclined towards leadership from our own group, naturally inclined. And that built upon that, the British did things that caused us to be confrontational towards each other. The manner in which they divided and ruled caused that confrontation. And therefore it required leadership to bring us together because of our common interests. But what Jagdeo continues to seek to do is to play upon that divide. An attempt in playing upon that divide, where there is a common together of the people of African descent, to suggest that because they come together to the exclusion probably of others, that they are racist. Now what does racism mean? Racism means that there is a psychological disposition of superiority to others. That's what racism means. And it goes on to mean that in pursuit of that psychological superiority, that you put institutional mechanisms and structures in place to give uh, privilege to the superior race over the other race. Now, I would like Jack Dio to show me in which manner and form the PNC and or in this instance, the teachers union, have structures in place to suggest superiority. Clearly, even with its dominance, one can see that the teachers at large have come out because of a common interest that has nothing to do with party politics. And here I want to introduce the concept of party politics as opposed to politics. Anything that seeks to deal with power in terms of decision-making, influencing decisions and policies is by its nature political. But that it does not necessarily redound to party politics. Because party politics is when a particular party is seeking to acquire office for the person, for the purpose of being able to make decisions on the national issues. But when a force seeks to impact decision making in its interests, that's politics, but not necessarily party politics. So that here is, here is Jan, you're trying to cross the line of understanding between politics and party politics. So yes, the GTU is involved in politics. Yes, GAU is involved in politics. Any trade union is involved in politics. But the extent to which these workers are struggling for wages and salaries 
irrespective of which government is in place. Because we saw the struggle under the APNU, we've seen the struggle now under the PPP. It is a political struggle by the workers for their benefit that is not a partisan party struggle. And that's that we need to understand. And so what we see is that in many regards, that there was no different to the British trying to divide and rule so as to maintain his hold on power. And in that regard, he is closer to any concept of racism. And the extent to which a lot of his people speak to the teachers as if they are not equal contributors to this country, claiming that they don't want to. I have seen posts, these people don't want to work, they want money and all of that. It is racist because it is suggesting an inferior position of these people to others. And therefore, invoking the concept subliminally of racism. So that really, if one wants to talk about racism, the person who is perpetrated and perpetuated a racist approach would be Jack Deal. And much of what he does is subliminal racism, divide and rule in the context where the teachers are not seen as the working class and therefore are seen as inferior to the working class in relation to their contribution to the national economy. Because uh, the PVP takes an economistic position which says, look, uh, life is really about economic activity. And the economic activity here are the working people. Those people are not the working people. And in fact, often referred to by them in the lexicon as the petty bourgeoisie, and more specifically, they have been referred to in the past from an ideological perspective as being parasitic, as being those who are benefited from the production and, and the returns of production of the working people. And therefore, they're not themselves naturally entitled because they don't produce. Notwithstanding <laughs> the fact that they prepare, mold, educate all those. Well, the fact in of the, the matter sector. is the way in which things have emerged ideologically, one now can no longer argue the case of the exclusion of the service sector because. On one hand, the service sector is critical to the human resource development that is essential for production. And on the other hand, when one talks about development, one sees that things like education and so are clear indicators of development and contributors to development. And so it's no longer one can argue that it's only the working class who are the foundation of growth and development. I want to ask you to do the impossible for us. Give us a sketch of Forbes Burnham, the labor leader, the working class friend, the advocate for the rights of people in exactly two minutes. That's all the time we have. One needs to recognize that when Forbes Burnham formed the People's National Congress, he did not have the support of all people, all the people of African descent. And that the, the African middle class to some extent, from then into the year of the WP was unsupported by Borno. And they were unsupported by Borno because here was someone who was intellectual, who may have been seen in terms of social standing as uh, middle class, not working class, but whose party attracted the working people, represented the working people, and therefore became the true representative of the working people 
in the context of a plural society where the working people straddle the ethnic groups. And so one could see that what Burnham did in terms of policies and programs was directed towards the working, the working people, as opposed to merely that narrow definition of the working class. Burnham was the true representative of the working people and got into conflict with those who, on one hand, only wanted to represent the working class by a Marxist definition, and the others, on the other hand, who saw him as betraying his class because he represented the working people more than any others, as opposed to representing that status group called the middle class. Final words on today's program, Nation Watch, from Mr. Vincent Alexander. He's getting, he's soon to become, I believe, an elder of the party. <laughs> um, Mr. Alexander is chair of the Burnham Foundation, and I'd like to thank you very much, sir, for taking time off from your busy schedule and perhaps even some rest after a very, very hectic night last night to appear on Nation Watch was to discuss Burnham and labor relations. Thank you very much, Marvin. To discuss Burnham and labor relations, to discuss Burnham, and our will never suffice. We have just scratched the surface. Precisely. I thank you very much. And viewers, I'd like to thank you for joining, with, joining us and staying the course of the program with us. We'll be back again with you next Sunday by God's grace. Until then, be safe and support the teachers in whatever way you can.